Good day, this is Pastor Dominique from Evander Revival Center. Welcome. It's good to have you. And thank you so much for taking the time to listen to a word from the Lord that I pray will elevate your faith and strengthen your confidence in God. Today I'm in the book of Exodus chapter 32 and I'll be reading from verse 15 down to verse 21. And listen to what the Bible says. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, and on the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There's a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it's not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So it was as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses became hot. His anger became hot. And he cast the tablets out of his hands and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which he had made, burnt it in the fire, ground it to powder, and he scattered it on the water and he made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? Now, as we read the book of Exodus, we read of the story of Moses. The story of Moses is a story of God's providence. In the book of Exodus, we see how the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, oppresses God's people. He oppresses God's people along with the Egyptian taskmasters. And Israel, in their oppression, in this abuse, they begin crying out to God. This was long before they had a priesthood, a holy Bible, a holy temple. All they had was prayer. And with prayer, they cry out to heaven. And Exodus chapter 2 verse 23 to 25 tells us that God heard their cry and he looked upon their affliction. Now I want to tell you, as a child of God, God hears your cry. He hears your prayer. He hears His children when they cry out to Him. When we come to God with humility and repentance, God hears us. And God heard Israel in Egypt. And what did He do? He provided for Israel a deliverer. A deliverer in the form of Moses. And He uses Moses... To go to Egypt when he's in the backside of the desert. He gives him a command when he had an encounter with God at the burning bush in the desert. He tells Moses to go to Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Moses goes and with great signs, miracles and wonders. We see how God delivers the nation of Israel out of Egypt. They didn't have to start a revolution. They didn't even have to begin a rebellion. They didn't have to raise up an army. God delivered them. And through Moses, we see signs, miracles, and wonders. You see, Moses had one encounter with God. And that one encounter set him up to face the most powerful man on earth up until that point in history. And Moses becomes like a god before Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. He becomes like a God before Pharaoh because God blesses him. God uses him. God speaks through him. God makes Moses his mouthpiece. Let me read this. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I've made you as a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron on your, uh, on your brother shall be your prophet. So God used Moses in such a way. And he worked through Moses in such a way that to Pharaoh, Moses was a god. And, and it all started with an encounter at the burning bush. I want to tell you, what we need more in the church, what we need as believers, is God encounters. God encounters produces lions. We see this in the life of Peter who... At the crucifixion of Jesus, he could not even acknowledge that he knew Jesus. Three times he denies Jesus and he flees away in regret. But somewhat 40, 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, 
we see how Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, he stands up in the marketplace in Jerusalem, rebukes the crowds, and calls them to repentance with boldness and confidence that he did not previously had. This coward in the scripture who could not even claim that he knew Jesus was now all of a sudden so bold that he could declare to the people in Jerusalem that they were the ones that crucified Jesus. What was the difference? It was an encounter with God. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Moses had. He had that God encounter. So now as he draws Israel out of Egypt, God blesses Israel. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 12 verse 36, as they came out of Egypt, Israel stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. He caused the Egyptians to look favorably upon the Israelites. Now, I want you to consider this. God can use your enemies to bless you. That's why it's not wise to wish away your enemies, because through them, God can work. And God can even work through heathens. God doesn't just work through Christians and born-again believers, but He can work through heathens, people that don't believe in Jesus Christ, like we do. And God did that in Egypt as Israel were coming out. And God blessed Israel. And it's awesome what God did. And it's awesome how Moses was obedient to God and how God used Moses to be a deliverer. But <laughs> as they come into the wilderness, after God had drowned Mo uh, Pharaoh, along with, you know, his special forces in the Red Sea, now they're in the wilderness. And yeah, from Exodus chapter 15, we see that Moses now has to Assume the responsibility of leading Israel. You see, it was one thing to deliver Israel. It's another thing entirely to lead the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel were not an easy nation to lead. Even God himself said in Exodus chapter 33 verse 3 that they are a stiff necked people. They are stubborn. I mean, this is God speaking, not even Moses, God himself said they are stubborn, they are stiff-necked. I mean, imagine speaking about your children like that. Imagine speaking about one of your children in such a way that you say, you know what, that child is just stubborn, a stiff-necked child. And in fact, I don't even want to journey with this child, live with this child anymore. That's what happened in the book of Exodus chapter 33. God got to the point where he said, I don't want to journey with Israel anymore because they keep doing what they want. They are stubborn. And now God is calling Moses to lead these people. I want to tell you, leadership is not easy. Leadership without the guidance of the Holy Spirit is not easy. Leadership without the grace of God is not easy. Leadership without the empowerment of heaven is not easy. And I almost want to say in ministry, it's almost impossible to lead without God empowering you, without God giving you the strength. And although God called them a stiff-necked people, Moses was faithful to the call to lead these people. And he took upon this task of leading them. And it was a holy burden. And I say that respectfully. It was a holy burden. You know... Leadership in the kingdom of God is not for the faint of heart. It's not like leadership in the world. In the world, it goes about how many people serve you and how many people report to you. But in the kingdom of God, it's how much people do you serve and how much people are you willing to serve, bless? How much people are you willing to report to as a leader and bless them? And influence them and love them and care for them in spite of their mistakes, in spite of their faults and flaws. You see, it's not for the faint of heart. Leadership in the church is not for the faint of heart. Leadership in the ministry is not for the faint of heart. You see, everybody's a great leader. Everybody's a great leader until they must lead. You know, we've all got the answers for this country and we know what to do as a president until we have to assume that office. 
We all know what we need to do as a coach of a sports team until we have to take on that role. We all know what our boss should do until we have to carry that burden of responsibility. We all know what the pastor should do in the church until we have to step into that calling. Everybody's a great leader until they have to lead. And I've learned that in ministry. I've learned that as a pastor. Everybody's got advice and everybody knows what to do and everybody is wise until they lead. And then they realize <laughs> leadership is tough. The position of leadership is tough. That baton of leadership can be quite heavy. And here is Moses leading somewhat two million people in a very hot uncomfortable place, a strange and a peculiar place that they've never been. Now they're wandering around in the desert and everybody's moaning. I can only imagine this must have zapped his strength and it must have made him feel so underappreciated. And not only that, he must have been so discouraged at times. I can only have compassion with Moses as I Read the book of Exodus and I see what took place with the nation of Israel. And even if you read the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and you read about the wanderings of Israel in the wilderness. I mean, you, you cannot but have an appreciation for Moses as a leader, what he had to put up with and what he had to go through. I just want to say this. Every company is different. Every organization is different. Every business is different. Every family is different. Every church is different. And what works in leadership in one area, in one company, one organization, one family, one church, what works there is not necessarily going to work in another organization, company, church, or family. Principles can be transferable between organizations, but the methods can be different. Godly principles, biblical principles will always stand the test of time, but how they are done and the approach that a leader should have can vary. That's why it's not wise to say, oh, they do it like this over there. So we should do it like they do it over there here. It's not wise because the culture could be different. The people's way of doing things can be different. The people's thinking can be different. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. And that's why we need to be submissive to God. And I've had to learn that if I'm in one area of ministry, it does not necessarily mean what worked here is going to work there. I have to be flexible enough to understand that the principles can stay the same, but the methods need to change. And this takes maturity. This takes a deep understanding of what it means to lead in the kingdom of God. And it also often requires experience. Although I believe God can use people regardless of experience. Because if they are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's got all the experience you need. But it's important to understand that leadership varies. The style of leadership can vary from place to place. So if you were in a church and that pastor had a way of leading, don't go to another church expecting that pastor to lead the same. Everything might be different in that church. The dynamics of that church might be different. And rather than trying to correct and direct and trying to tell the leader what to do, look, in what, look for ways to support the leader. Look for ways, not just in church, but in business. In commerce, look for ways to support. Now, we see that God is faithful. In the scriptures, we see that God is faithful. God is faithful because he never allows us to be tested above that which we, can, we cannot bear. I believe it's First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. I just want to get the scripture. And it's important to understand that before God calls somebody to a great position, He first puts them through great testing and He first puts them through great training. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. Now no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted 
or tested beyond what you are able to bear. So, in other words, what Paul is telling us, that God will not allow us to go through anything or carry a responsibility that we cannot handle. He loves us too much for it. Although we might desire a position, although we might desire an office, God will first train us. He trains us in the shadows like he did with Moses. He trained Moses in the shadows, in the dark. For about 40 years, God hid Moses in the backside of the desert and he used him to be a shepherd over sheep. And that was his training. Could it be that you feel like you're stuck in obscurity. It feels like as if things aren't working out. Could it be that God is busy working on you because there's something great and awesome in your future? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 that we are the workmanship of God. I am His workmanship. You are His workmanship. We are His workmanship. And if we are His workmanship, it means that God is busy working on us. Let me read it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God is into preparation. While we want the promise, God says, no, I want to prepare you. I want to prepare you so that you can handle the promise. And whenever God is busy preparing somebody, whenever God is busy working on somebody, he'll often hide them away. He will hide them away and he will plant them in a dark place so that they can grow. John chapter 12 verse 24, Jesus said, Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it should die, it will produce much fruit, a harvest. So it's in those dark places where God takes out of us things that aren't beneficial and that are a disadvantage to us. It's, it's in those shadows, in those dark seasons where God changes us, molds us, shapes us. I mean, even with Jesus Christ, for 30 years, the Bible says he was in Nazareth. Luke chapter 2 verse 51 to 52. For 30 years, he has the Son of God. He's got to change the world. He's got to bring salvation and redemption to mankind. And yet the Father hid him away for 30 years in Nazareth. And in Nazareth, all he did was he was obedient to his parents. He just did what his parents said. He, he obeyed them and he submitted to them. You know, it's difficult today to get people to be submissive, especially if they've got a prophecy and a calling. Because who are you to tell them that they're going to have to submit and serve for a season when they are called to change the world? When they've been marked with destiny, when a prophet or an apostle has prophesied over them? But I want to tell you, great leaders are very, very, very great servants. Let me just rephrase that. To be a great leader, you need to be a great servant. And we see in the scriptures where there were great shepherds, there were great leaders. Moses being one. Great shepherd, great leader. He had to learn to lead sheep before he had to learn to lead people. You know, God trained me in the Sunday school ministry of our church before he made me the pastor of our church. How many years? 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, six years. God trained me in the Sunday school, teaching toddlers, infants, the gospel for six years. And then God promoted me into pastoral duties and responsibility but what am i trying to say god will often let you look after the sheep before he makes you the king you'll first have to be the shepherd before you become the king first samuel chapter 17 verse 28 we see how elip he mocks david and he even says to david <laughs> you look after that handful of sheep David had a handful of sheep to look after. Little did his dad Jesse know along with Elip, his oldest brother, that one day he would become the greatest king the nation of Israel would ever know. But it started with him looking after sheep. What is your sheep? What is your pasture? What is that place? What is that training lab that God has got you in? Don't despise it. The Bible says don't despise the day of small beginnings. God could be forming you. And I just want to say this. 
We live in a generation that is so quick to look for recognition. When it comes to the kingdom of God, don't look for recognition quickly. Let recognition come to you. Because looking for recognition comes at a price. It comes at a price. I don't want to be easily recognized. I don't want to, I don't want people, I don't want people to know me if God hasn't ordained for me to be known. As long as I'm known by God and I know God and I serve Him and I'm in the will of God, I'm happy. And that's where we should all be. Now, I'm not saying I've arrived, not at all. But I just want to encourage you because maybe you feel nobody sees me. I don't get the credit. I'm serving. I'm working. And it feels like somebody else is getting the rewards. Well, God is keeping record in heaven. And at the right time, he will promote you. Now we see how Moses is busy leading the nation of Israel around in the wilderness. And in Exodus chapter 19, the Bible says after three months of wandering, they came to the Mount of Sinai. Now Moses brings the nation of Israel to the Mount Sinai. Why? Because he had an encounter with God on the mountain. And Moses wants to bring the nation of Israel to God. He wants to bring them to the promiser before he takes them to the promise. Because he wants them to have the same encounter he had with God. Because if they should go into the promised land before encountering the promiser, they will turn the promised land into a land of idolatry. So Moses wants them to first have that encounter, that relationship with God. In fact, in Exodus chapter 8 verse 1 and Exodus chapter 9 verse 1, we read of how the purpose of Israel being delivered out of Egypt was to worship God, was to come into worship with God. Now in Exodus chapter 19, Yar is the nation of Israel at the foot of the mountain. Yar is God on the mountain. Yar is Moses. He's the liaison between God and the people. And God speaks to Moses and he tells Moses, tell the people to consecrate themselves. For on the third day after they had arrived, I will come down and meet them. They were to consecrate themselves because God was going to have an encounter with them. And Moses gives them this instruction. And this is a big moment in the history of Israel. This is a crucial moment. And in fact, if you read the scripture, you sense in the scripture that God is wanting that relationship with his children. Right throughout scripture, God wants relationship with his children. In fact, he's a God of relationship. He's a God of connection. When Jesus came to earth, he was called Emmanuel, God with us. Not Emmanuel, God far from us or God that avoids us, but God with us. He wants to be with us. And even if you read about the wanderings of Israel in the wilderness, you see that God wants to tabernacle amongst his people. So Moses speaks to the nation of Israel, tells them to consecrate themselves. And then we read in Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 to 20, how God comes down upon Mount Sinai. And it's thunder clouds and it's lightning bolts and it's an awesome sight to behold as God comes down in front of Israel who are at the foot of the mountain standing off in the distance but as he comes down and as he speaks the people get frightened and in Exodus chapter 20 verse 18 to 20 they get so frightened that they say to Moses no we don't want to speak to God you speak to God on our behalf you be our spokesperson and then you tell us what God wants to say. Quite tragic. Because this is the moment where Israel rejected relationship with God and they chose religion. They rejected having that intimate relationship with God and they chose to rather have religion. They chose for somebody rather to stand in the gap between them and God. And what we see take place from Exodus chapter 20 right on throughout the Old Testament is religion. Religion. Uh, this is where man tries to appease God with their rituals, with their, with their rules and regulations, and uh, tries to appease their conscience in how they worship God. And there's that heartfelt devotion that's somewhere lost. In the Old Testament. And Jesus comes to restore that in the New Testament. But the point I'm trying to make is Moses had an encounter with God. And, and the book says, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20 verse 21 that Moses drew nearer to God. He, he drew near to the presence of God while the people stood afar off. What a contrast. 
What a contrast to have one group of people on the one side that are far off fearing God and one person drawing near to God. You know, I've thought about this a lot. How, how did Moses have that confidence to come into the presence of God while the nation of Israel just didn't have it? And they became so insecure in how they approached God. And I believe it's got a lot to do with the background that they had because Moses was raised up in a palace. Moses was raised up as um, a son of Pharaoh. So he would have been raised up in royalty and he would have had, uh, um, he would have had a wealth mindset. He would have had a mindset of prosperity, a mindset of blessing. Well, fear, uh, well, Israel, they were raised in slavery and oppression and they saw leadership and they saw authority as a dictatorship. So their mindset limited them. That's my opinion from experiencing the goodness of God, experiencing a relationship with God. And I say that because our mindsets can be the limitation to experiencing more of God. The way you've been brought up, the way you've, um, you know, your relationship you had with your father, the relationship you had with your mother, that, that sets you up for your relationship with God, for the positive or the negative. And there was a time in my life where I had to learn that God is not like my earthly father. My earthly father was a good man, but he wasn't a perfect man. But I had to learn that God, my heavenly father, is not like him. And that God loves me unconditionally. And there's nothing I can do to try and gain his approval. He's given it to me through the cross of Calvary. And he's invited me to have a relationship with him, to boldly come before, before his throne and experience him. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 103 verse 7 that, Moses knew God, but Israel only knew his acts. In fact, I want to read that. Psalm 103, verse 7. Listen to this powerful passage of Scripture because, again, we see the contrast between the relationship that Israel had with God and Moses had with God. And listen to what he says, what the Bible says. He made his... He made his ways known to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. So Moses knew the ways of God. But Israel only knew his acts. They did not have that intimate knowledge of God. They did not have that intimacy with God. And, you know, if you know somebody's ways, you can predict what they're going to do even before they do it. You know, my wife knows my ways. She can look at me. After seven years of marriage, she can look at me, she can look at my facial expression, she can hear the tone of my voice, and she can already predict what's going on in my heart or what I'm going to do. And vice versa, and as we, as we go on in our marriage, that, that uh, knowing, that intuition just becomes stronger. And Moses had that intuition about God, that he knew instinctively what God would do, how God would respond, what God would say. <laughs> what an awesome relationship to have. But Israel only knew the acts of God. They did not know God intimately. They did not have that intimacy with God. It's one thing to know that God can do something. It's another thing to know the God that can do something. So now Moses goes into the presence of God in Exodus chapter 20. And from Exodus chapter 20 right up to Exodus chapter 32, he's in the presence of God. And God is giving him revelation and God is giving him these laws and God is showing him what he needs to do as he leads the nation of Israel. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 24 verse 18, he was 40 days and nights in the presence of God. I mean, it was phenomenal what he must have been experiencing. So get the picture. Yes, Moses in the presence, in the glory cloud, on top of the mountain. And yes, the people, somewhat 2 million people at the foot of the mountain, standing off from a distance and they waiting for Moses. And they get impatient. And in Exodus chapter 32, we see how they get impatient. So much so that they decide that they're going to build idols. They build golden calves. They approach Aaron, Moses' brother, and they say, This man, Moses, is taking too long. Let us build idols. And now they start building these idols. And they start worshipping these idols. Now, yes, Moses in the presence. And yes, the nation of Israel busy with idolatry. I want to tell you. We are all worshippers. If I say we are worshippers, I don't mean we can all play musical instruments. And I'm not saying that we've all got um, a musical intuition. That's not what I'm saying. Music is one form of worship. Worship is 
devoting your life to something or to someone. And we have been created to worship. We have been created to worship. And you know, you will never understand this notion of being created to worship until you experience God. And have an encounter with God. Because when you do, then you'll realize that He fulfills you. He fulfills that gap in your heart. He, he gives you your desires. He, he becomes your pleasure. And then you realize how awesome it is to worship God. We live in a generation where we've got people that have got this void. This God-shaped void in their hearts. And they're trying to fill it with so many things of this world. Sex, drugs, alcohol. Worldly entertainment, pleasures, worldly wealth, things outside of God's plan and purpose. And it's not satisfying them. And until they come into contact with God and they worship God, then they can experience God. Then they will realize that that is where true contentment is. That's where I discovered true contentment. And that's where I found peace. But you see, we're all busy worshiping. You worshiping, I'm worshiping. And we must choose. Are we going to be in the presence of God? Worshipping Him. Making Him a priority. Devoting ourselves to Him. Or are we going to be busy with golden calves? Idols. Making something or someone else a priority above God. When something or someone else is a priority be above God, that is an idol. That is an idol. Today we don't have literal idols in our culture. But we've got idols of the heart. We've got idols in society. There's idolatry taking place all around, even in churches. And that's why we've got to be very vigilant to make sure that our devotion, our priority is God. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first. That must be our priority. So Moses is now up in the presence of God. He hears that the people are now busy worshipping idols. He comes down... From the presence of God. Here is Joshua waiting for him. He's too I see. And Joshua says, I hear a shout. And Moses says, this is not the shout of victory. And this is not a shout of defeat. They're not busy in battle. But this is the shout of dancing and singing. In other words, this is worship. They're busy worshiping. And he comes down and the Bible says something. And let me read it again. Verse 15 of Exodus chapter 32. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain. And the two tablets of testimony were in his hand. Okay. The tablets were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. Verse 16. Now the tablets were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Here is Moses, what he has experienced for 40 days, what he has encountered for 40 days. He's now got physical proof because God himself wrote on the tablets. And as God wrote on these two tablets, the Ten Commandments, this is a testimony of Moses. That's what the Bible says. It was his testimony. And the Bible says Moses comes down from the mountain after experiencing God, after Having this awesome encounter with God. And he's got the work of God in his hands. And as he comes down. He sees the people worshipping the golden calves. And the Bible says he became angry. And he destroyed the tablets. He destroyed the testimony that he had. In a fit of rage. In anger. He destroys what God gave him. I've seen this happen so many times. I've seen how people can destroy their testimony. Because of what somebody else is doing. Because of what somebody else said. Because of what she did or what he did. I've come to tell you today. Hold on to your testimony. The devil is trying to provoke you and me to destroy our testimony. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 25 we see how David... Was insulted by a man called Nabal. And Nabal was just. He was just a rude man. And he insulted David. And David decided. That's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and wipe this guy out. And David is on his way to Nabal's house. To wipe him out. And Abigail the wife of Nabal. Hears about this. Approaches David. 
and she brings gifts and she comes in humility before David and she soothes his anger and she prevents him from going to kill Nabal, Nabal. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 25 verse 28 that Abigail says to David, if you do not take this vengeance, I know that God will grant you an enduring house, a dynasty of kings. And David would even testify, had Abigail not come and stopped him, he would have surely killed Nabal. Why is that important to know? The enemy was trying to provoke David from destroying his destiny. And the enemy is trying to provoke you and he's trying to tempt you. From destroying your testimony. Don't give him the pleasure. We all experience disappointment. We all experience rejection. We all have criticism. There are things that happen that.